speaker series on water resources sponsored by the Freshwater Society and the University of Minnesota's Council of Biological Sciences. Uh, and a special welcome to those watching on uh, streaming video. These uh, free lectures are not free without the generous support of our co-sponsors, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and the Minnesota Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts. The lecture series honors Malcolm Moos, a former University of Minnesota president. Uh, I urge all of you who are not already Freshwater Society members to uh, take this, this, uh, this lecture and this message to heart. Uh, envelopes are available on your way out, and uh, um, f please uh, sign up. Thanks also to Tom Hayes, the interim dean of the College of Biological Sciences. Uh, dean Hayes will moderate the question and answer period uh, after the lecture. Since February of 2010, we've hosted 16 lectures with national and international leaders on many subjects, uh, including uh, fracking and hydraulic fracturing, uh, groundwater sustainability, rural and urban pollution of surface waters, endocrine disruptors of our lakes and rivers, uh, water and air pollution from too much human produced nitrogen, and invasive carp. Uh, in 1992, Minnesota Governor Arnie Carlson issued his now famous challenge to make the Minnesota River fishable and swimmable in 10 years. Well, the uh, proclamation led to a flurry of activity, but uh, little change to the condition of the Minnesota River 10 years after that proclamation was made. Uh, things have gotten better for the fish in the Minnesota River since then, but uh, there are still considerable challenges. Uh, one of those is the tremendous load of sediment that the river carries. Uh, decades have been spent studying the problem and determining the sources of the soil flowing down the river. And it's past time that we take steps to stem that flow. Now, the Freshwater Society and the College of Biological Sciences and our co-sponsors are pleased to have Dr. Peter Wilcock join us tonight to talk about these next steps. Professor Wilcock grew up uh, amidst corn and beans of East Central Illinois and feels right at home working uh, on the same kind of landscape in Southern Minnesota. Uh, he sent his oldest son to the University of Minnesota and is proud to have a nearly unbroken string of January visits to the Twin Cities, <coughs> stretching almost 25 years. He frequently collaborates with colleagues in Minnesota to research the Minnesota River. Uh, Professor Wilcock received his PhD in Earth Science at MIT in 1987 and specializes in erosion and sedimentation processes and their application to watershed restoration and management. After serving on the faculty of Johns Hopkins University for 27 years, he recently joined Utah State University uh, as the head of Watershed Sciences Department uh, in the Quinney College of Natural Resources. Professor Wilcock is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and received the Hans Albert Einstein Award from the American Society of Civil Engineers for outstanding contributions to the understanding of sediment transport in gravel bed rivers. Uh, Professor Wilcock works to understand the movement of sediments and to use this understanding to guide public policy decisions uh, regarding stream restoration, water quality, and watershed management. So Dr. Wilcock's tonight, talk tonight is titled Sediment, Science, and Stakeholders, Clearing the Muddy Waters of the Minnesota River. And as usual, we will have a panel of Minnesota experts who will join Dr. Wilcock in answering questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we are, have been passing out uh, file cards, and we will pass, a, pass them out um, uh, during the talk uh, for your questions to write down, and uh, Freshwater Society staff will collect them at the end of the lecture. So please help me welcome Dr. Peter Wilcock. Thank you. Is this oh, good? Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Um, that introduction took care of one item of, of business partially, but I want to complete that. The uh, uh, what's a guy from Utah or a guy from Baltimore doing coming to uh, Minnesota and telling you about your rivers? Um, you heard about the uh, where I grew up. This could be southern Minnesota, but it is in fact Champaign County. Illinois, so I do have corn and beans in my uh, system, but that doesn't really explain why I've uh, come to uh, Minnesota so often, and uh, this, is, this is the reason why. Uh, the Twin Cities and the University is the home of the greatest environmental water lab 
uh, in the world, not only because of its stunning physical plant, but even more because of the people that work there. And I've been coming here since 1991, and I'm lucky to call uh, a number of the uh, uh, staff and faculty there, uh, colleagues and, and friends. Uh, as part of that work, uh, there was the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics, uh, NSF-funded Science and Technology Center that um, uh, uh, included a major effort to understand part of the Minnesota River uh, uh, Basin. <clears throat> I'm going to report on uh, and try and synthesize uh, much work, um, most of which is not mine uh, and can be attributed to uh, many different uh, research institutions and agencies uh, which are which are shown here uh, too many people to enumerate uh, but there are three people that I think deserve special acknowledgement for uh, helping us to understand uh, what we do about the Minnesota uh, the first two Karen Gran and Patrick Belmont have been uh, I've had the good fortune of working closely with them over the last seven or eight years much of the really exciting stuff that we've discovered has been because of the exceptional work that they've done. Uh, Karen is right here in Minnesota at, at uh, Duluth and is certainly one of the shining lights uh, for the future of understanding fresh water uh, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, the third person, he's going to kill me for this, but uh, is Pat Bassfield uh, at the MPCA. Um, and he's there partly for his own sweet self, partly because that picture, which I pulled off the web, uh, is him standing at the mouth of the, of the Blue Earth River where it goes into the, into the Minnesota, but mostly because he represents a really extraordinary effort at stream monitoring that's been going on in the Minnesota River Basin and elsewhere. Um, these are people that are out at night. They're chasing storms on Easter. They're putting old parts uh, in their garage so that they can monitor more streams. Uh, just an exceptional effort. And to the extent that we know things about the Minnesota River, rather than just guessing, it's because of the gauging data uh, uh, that they've collected and, and that work certainly merits our, our um, uh, continued support. Okay, there's uh, Lake Pepin and it's three Drainages. I hope you'll find that the story of the Minnesota River is a rollicking good tale of uh, surprises and clever science, uh, some twists and turns, and um, I will uh, 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 try to keep you engaged in that way. But it's also, and this is a, a, an important point I want to follow up uh, this evening, it's also, I think, one of our great uh, chances in this country to solve what I think is the major environmental problem that we face, which is what do we do with distributed sources or non-point sources of material or pollutants that get into rivers. Uh, the Minnesota has a lot of built-in advantages, geologic, uh, 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 it has a uniform land use, and it's all in one state or almost all. We can neglect the Dakota and the Iowa part pretty much. Um, and that, that suggests that if, if we're going to tackle and succeed in solving the non-point pollutant problem, this is a really good opportunity. But there's another reason, and that is that the one state that that river is in is in the state of Minnesota. Okay, and this is not just pandering to the audience, although I'm doing that a little bit, but this is a state uh, you know, well-educated, a strong civic sense, a sense of conservation ethics that are, that, that have currency uh, um, within government and throughout the state. And then this extraordinary thing, as an example, is this constitutional amendment you all passed, taxing yourselves for clean water, among other things, habitat, music, and so forth. I mean, that's, that's, that's unusual behavior, okay? And so let's, let's hope that uh, this, uh, uh, this, this can lead to some uh, success. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the sediment sources, sinks, delivery, how we understand what's going on in the Minnesota River Basin. 
I want to talk about what we know and how we know it, because this is a very big basin and there are a lot of uncertainties, but we can still learn uh, enough to take action if we, if we choose to, and um, applying uncertain science to supporting decision making is, is a key part of where we're headed. There's a watershed story and there's a social story. Humans clearly have played a big role in altering the landscape of the Minnesota River. And if we're going to change it, that's completely a social choice. Uh, and there are challenges involved in taking uncertain science and, um, and, and taking action on it. OK, we'll start with the geology. <clears throat> Something like, I, I always turn to Kerry for this, something like, uh, when, when was the Des Moines lobe out there? 14,000 years ago. So things are going to happen really fast. 14,000, oh, radiocarbon. So 16,000 years ago, uh, the remains of the last ice sheet pushing down into, into Iowa, okay? Leveling things off nice and clean. Uh, about 14,000 to 13,000, uh, 13 and a half thousand years ago, the ice had retreated, was blocking drainage to the Hudson Bay, glacial Lake Agassiz formed, and drained through Glacial River Warren, which is where the Minnesota River is today. <clears throat> Something happened about 13,400 years ago, probably more than once. This lake drained catastrophically through uh, River Warren, okay? And in doing so, it carved an enormous valley, which if you've never noticed, it's easy. I mean, you fly into MSP, there's this kind of yawning canyon that you fly over. That's uh, the result of that uh, catastrophic flooding and the downcutting that occurred. If we look at a long profile, so this is elevation and distance to the mouth uh, of, of the Minnesota River, uh, the confluence with the Mississippi, and these are all of the tributaries coming in, or all of the major ones, you can notice that many of them have a sharp drop at the downstream end. They are responding to this downcutting of the Minnesota River order 50, 60 meters uh, 13 and a half thousand years ago. If we zoom in down here at Mankato, at that, at that bend in the Minnesota River, um, here are the three rivers draining the Lesseur watershed, okay, and this is their long profile. This is where they meet the Minnesota. This is where they were 13 and a half thousand years ago. You pull the plug, they cut down, and it creates what we call a nick zone. There's a nick in that long profile. The incising rivers of the Minnesota River Basin are some of the fastest a geologically fastest incising rivers anywhere in the world, okay? 60 meters is not a big deal in the Himalayas, but it's cutting through till, it's not cutting through rock. So it's a very active uh, landscape. And it produces a landscape that in some ways is upside down. This is what the Minnesota River looks like, the most of the basin, most of the land area. It's very flat, okay? The, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, rather lazy streams, mud in the bed. It's easy to conduct a research meeting just standing in the river and, and uh, you know, not, not going anywhere. And this is the Minnesota River lowlands. Okay, we've got the majestic peaks of the Lesseur Bluffs there. We've got the ski area with the fine uh, uh, base lodge that you can see down at the bottom. And we have gravel and cobble, not mud in the rivers. So instead of having the ski area and the peaks and the gravel and cobble in the highlands, in the uplands, it's in the lowlands. So things are sort of turned uh, uh, upside down. And this is like a grand experiment in how you evolve a landscape. You talk, start with something flat, perfectly flat. You cut a nick in it down here. You pull the plug, you lower the base level 60 meters, and you get this very active uh, uh, propagation of a drainage network up into that land. This is a high-resolution 
a digital elevation model just showing the uplands and some of the complexity of the uh, valley that's being carved out. Okay, and this is just taking, uh, you know, uh, this is still the very lower part of the, of the drainage. You can see where everything is flat and you can see where the river is cutting in. This is the city of Mankato and the um, um, Minnesota River flowing by. So I'm going to log what we know. And if you're getting tired, there'll be 10 points in the end. So you can track everything I'm saying. So the first point is that the Minnesota River Basin is geologically primed to be a big producer of sediment. Because of that nick point drop, because the rivers are cutting into and creating a new drainage network. OK, two other things we need to know about. One is that the Minnesota goes into the Mississippi, and then it goes into Lake Pepin. Some people like Lake Pepin. Maybe some people, it's not such a big deal. It certainly gets attention. Um, uh, it is, if you didn't know, the birthplace of water skiing, or at least it's one of the places that, that claim that. It is an iconic body of water. It is a temporary body of water. It's right in the Mississippi. It's, 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 it's dammed. It's filling in by this sediment that's coming along. The question is, how quickly will it fill in? Not in our lifetime, but uh, the pace seems to be quickening. And then the other thing we have to note is the extraordinary conversion of land use in the Minnesota River Basin uh, since uh, the mid to late 19th century, uh, where uh, row crops have become by far the dominant uh, land use. And in order to make those row crops work, uh, the land has to be drained. Okay, and so this is an image of part of the Lesur River Basin, and you can see from the drying, uh, from the patterns of, of soil moisture, where the tile lines, the pattern tile, has been uh, installed. So you've got this flat landscape, you've pulled the plug, you're building these new drainages, and then along the way, you just sort of uh, 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 drain the whole thing and plant it in row crops. Not the whole thing, but certainly the vast majority. So the hydrologic regime of the Minnesota River Basin underwent wholesale changes in the past 150 years. Um, this has created attention. Uh, this has created efforts. Uh, the PCA pulled together a group of people that were working on sediment sources within the Minnesota River Basin and asked them to find out what they agreed about. And we did that, and uh, I was somewhat shocked to realize that it was five and a half years ago. I thought it was like last year. Uh, this is available online. If what I'm talking about is of interest, uh, uh, it was written for an audience uh, much like this one. So the first thing that we agreed on is that most of the sediment delivered to Lake Pepin is delivered from the Minnesota river and that this rate of delivery has increased dramatically in the last 150 years. This is uh, rightfully so an iconic diagram. Many of you have probably seen it. It's from sediment cores in Lake Pepin. The sediment cores are dated and then from the dates and the thickness of the deposition you can get something about sedimentation rate and you can see that somewhere between 1800 and 1900 things started really picking up and somewhere around the Second World War, they kind of maxed out, and they've remained high ever since. Okay, uh, 15 years ago, work was done to identify, based on the composition of the sediment, that most of that sediment comes from the Minnesota, not from the Mississippi, not from the St. Croix. Many of you have probably seen this picture. I mean, it's, it's kind of something that, yeah, it's pretty obvious to look at. Um, one of the themes I want to follow, though, is that all of this information very much needs independent confirmation. We need redundancy. We need to look at things in, from multiple different perspectives because it's a big, complicated system, and we're looking at the prospects of spending a lot of money trying to change it. This is some information, one of the few plots that I'm showing that I actually made. Uh, this is from... Um, uh, um, uh, gauging uh, data of uh, total suspended solids. 
um, um, the percent coming from the Minnesota River. So it's using gauging on the Minnesota and then on the Mississippi and the St. Croix just saying how much is coming out of one pipe versus the other two. And you can see that in most years when the, the suspended sediment supply is high, you know, there's an average that says something like uh, 75%. The geochemical analysis said 88%. There's no doubt that the sediment is coming from the Minnesota River. Based on more gauging, uh, these colors here are showing the uh, annual loads coming out of the different uh, main tributaries to the Minnesota River. And of course, uh, drawn in USSR or uh, Russian red to get your attention, the Blue Earth, the Lesur, the Rush, High Island, and Sand Creeks are the ones that are producing uh, uh, the most sediment. This is also the most incised part of the Minnesota River Valley. Okay, the bluffs, the, uh, 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 the relief along the river uh, is a maximum. Okay, so Lake Pepin is filling. That's not news. It's been going on for a long time. Okay, however, a big sediment supply, remember the Minnesota River is primed geologically to deliver a lot of sediment, but that big supply seems to have gone up almost an order of magnitude, tenfold. Okay, and most of that sediment is coming from the most incised parts of the Minnesota River Basin. So here's an interesting question. We've all thought, we've all heard about soil erosion. There's actually lots of debates about whether soil erosion is as big a problem as it used to be 70 years ago, but it still goes on. But this land is really flat. If it's really flat, it's hard to move water and, and soil off of it. So we can ask, you know, where does that sediment come from? Is it small erosion rates over big areas? This is Mankato. This is a big chunk of the Lesur Basin. Small erosion rates over a huge area or really huge erosion rates from a very small area of incision. And I can tell you that it's really easy if you have a mind to reach one conclusion or the other, that it's all coming from fields or it's all coming from bluffs, it's easy to get there. And you can get there in a way that you know, refers to literature and seems uh, uh, based on, on reason. And so the challenge that we face is how do we, how do we get the balance among all the different kinds of information? How do we develop confidence in where, we're, in where we're headed? So the work that a number of us did, and this is where Karen Grant and Patrick Belmont really took the lead, is we developed a budget for the sediment. And we started in the Lesur because it's what I refer to as the beating muddy heart of the Minnesota River Basin. It produces more sediment than any other um, um, uh, of, of the tributaries. And I actually remember about 10 years ago, Kerry uh, Jennings came to the uh, uh, St. Anthony Falls Laboratory, and she said, let me tell you about this Lesur place. It's, it's really muddy. Uh, that got our attention. What we want with the sediment budget is um, to do a mass balance, account for all the inputs, and all the outputs, and we can't create or destroy sediment mass. We can't volatilize it, okay? It can be stored along the way. We have to account for all those pieces. And uh, this is a good place for me to mention that the field of watershed analysis and geomorphology, the study of landscapes and how they evolve, um, has undergone a, a stunning explosion based on new kinds of methods. The first method is, uh, it's a little hard to see here, but this is actually a digital elevation model of part of the landscape, okay? We can fly airplanes and use lasers to get centimeter scale uh, uh, elevation everywhere. We have computers that allow us to process that data and make really cool maps. But what the, the important thing is, is with that elevation information, we can also make calculations. We can make water and sediment move around because we have this spatially extensive high resolution topography. That's simply, uh, you know, anyone that's gone on a hike with a USGS uh, quad map, I mean, it's a new world. It's completely changed. 
Another thing is we've been flying planes now for quite a while, and we've taken pictures of the landscape over a long enough period of time that we can actually measure change. Right? If you, if you have a picture from the 30s, which we do in any agricultural area in this country, you can say that's what it was and this is what it is now. Okay, that's a long enough time to detect change. Radiogenic tracers, also known as sediment fingerprinting. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, it, it, it's extraordinary. Basically, we can tell if sediment has been on the surface, like a, a plowed field, or whether it's come from a, a, a steep bluff uh, not exposed to uh, precipitation. Stuff rains out, sticks to the soil, and that allows us to take a teaspoon of sediment from Lake Pepin and say this much came from soil, this much came from stream banks. Absolutely extraordinary uh, uh, kind, kind of stuff. And then lots of uh, uh, elbow grease, lots of field work, um, uh, OSL is optically stimulated luminescence, which is another way of telling how long grains have been exposed on the surface. I mean, believe me, we couldn't have done any of this even, even a couple, couple decades ago. Applying all this work to the Lasur, uh, we looked for the different sources. So sediment could come from agricultural fields. Okay, It could come from the stream banks eroding. Although when the stream bank erodes, there's also deposition, storage of sediment on the floodplain. But then there are these ravines. So this is the incipient drainage network moving up into that flat glacial landscape. And this whole thing has cut down, in some cases, 60 meters or more close to the Minnesota River. And so you have what we call bluffs, these, these steep cliffs that are producing sediment. So how much comes from these different sources? Is it a little bit of sediment per area from a huge area? Is it a lot of sediment per area from a small area? Okay. The end result was um, this is the uplands, the flat part of the landscape that has not seen incision. This is what we call the lowlands, the parts that, that has been incised. What we found, and we did not expect to find this, uh, was that most the biggest, so this is 225 thousand megagrams or metric tons per year uh, coming out of the watershed on average over this decade. Okay, Just about half is coming out of bluffs. Okay, If we also include banks that are eroding because of meandering or eroding because the channel has gotten wider or coming out of ravines, all of this adds up to the majority of the sediment. So sediment is being introduced from the top, it comes out in the bottom. FP means floodplain. Some of it gets stored in the floodplain. This is a mass balance. And it forces us to constrain all of the different information uh, in order to come up uh, with something. Um, down here, I put some quotes. None of them are attributed. Um, they're either Ron Popeil or Yogi Berra, or in this case, me. Uh, little pride, much honor. We'll take any information we can to try and put together a mass balance. It's a hard thing to do. But we have much honor in evaluating, thinking critically about how this stuff uh, is put together. Um, the gauging was the thing that really convinced us that we had the story right. Again, this is the sediment coming in through the incised portion of the watershed. Here's the incised portion of the water. This is the Lasur again. This is the incised portion of the watershed. There are gauges above the incised part on the three main streams, and there are three gauges below. Uh, particularly this one here on the Maple River, there's almost no increase in drainage area moving along. And you can see right here, Maple River, uh, 100 uh, pounds per acre per day in this plot. Uh, to something like 270, 280. It's picking up all the sediment, right? I mean, water comes off the top with not too much sediment in it. It goes, flows through these cliffs, and it's full of sediment. Okay. Ron Popeil, right? Does anybody remember Ron Popeil? <laughs> I think he's still alive, but he sold uh, Ronco. So um, here's something that we never anticipated. And this, this was the most fun part of the project. 
Um, because this landscape was pretty much flat 13 and a half thousand years ago, we know when, we know it was flat, we can fill it back in, right? We can say how much, how big is that hole in the ground? Because we know how long it took that sediment uh, uh, to come out. And what we found is on average 50,000 tons, metric tons per year uh, came out from the excavation of the valley. Remember the recent number is 225,000 tons. But then one question, if you think about it, if you pull the plug right here, okay, on this landscape, you're doing this experiment, do you think most of the sediment is going to come out really quick because the gradient is the highest? And then as, as it erodes, it, the slope goes down and it, you know, it's producing less and less sediment? Or do you think that most of the sediment will come out later on because even though the gradient is lying down, the area is getting much, much bigger, right? So what, what does that pattern look like? Well, it turns out all these little colored things, yellow, green, red, those are the terraces. Those are erosional remnants left behind as these streams are cutting down. Those erosional remnants can be dated. How long they've been exposed, how long sunlight has been shining on the grains of sand that are exposed. With those dates, we could, uh, this is Karen Grant's work, we could describe, so that's the Royal Lee, obviously, the, we could describe how these valleys evolved, and it turns out that this is our estimate. So here's 50,000, that's the average, over 13 and a half thousand years. It turns out that it, it, you know, it kind of went up to a certain level, and then it's just been producing uh, uh, at, at a steady rate ever since. What's really interesting then is um, this is today. So most non-point source pollution problems, uh, you don't know what the background is. We actually have a background rate, which is, I think, kind of cool. So here's the budget for what we call the Holocene, that, that period from the end of the Ice Age to the present. Below the nick point, above the nick point, this is the 225, this is the 55, um, and that's the mass balance that we, that we put together. So both near-channel sources, bluffs, ravines, and fields are major contributors. Right now, in this current time, near-channel sources are the biggest. The increase in the rate of the sediment supply, about a factor of four, is consistent with that increase that we see in Lake Pepin in the sedimentation. Okay, they're not the same number. Four is a different number from ten. Uh, in, in, the, in the sediment trade, we often think that's, that's probably close enough. But the point is that we can explain a change of increase in supply of a large amount at the same time coincident with an increase in deposition in Lake Pepin. That's another line of evidence that is useful. So what happens to the rest of that sediment? Could be air. Uh, it could, uh, there is a factor that says that it could be stored along the lower Minnesota River. So this is Mankato. Here are four gauge locations. Um, and uh, remember, this valley is not only deep, but it is really, really wide. Okay, it can store sediment. Um, and uh, this is a measure of the annual sediment supply from gauging uh, along this reach. And if all of it came out of Fort Stelling, it would plot along this line. If 25% is stored, it plots there and so forth. And you can see that under the current regime, 25 to 50% of the sediment is, in fact, apparently stored along the, uh, along the Minnesota River Valley. So another possibility is, what if the Minnesota became less effective at storing sediment over the European settlement period? What if we built levees and removed snags and removed places to deposit sediment? Okay, that would suggest that the sediment that's coming down could move through more efficiently, less of it would store. That's another reason why uh, um, uh, the, the four times increase in sediment load uh, uh, under the current era might translate into more sediment getting into Lake Pepper. Okay, so 20th century reduction in sediment storage may magnify the sediment signal. And we're all the way up to seven. Okay, oh wait, ha ha, there's more. <clears throat> 
Okay, a little bit more on the sediment fingerprinting, about which I know almost nothing, but I do know the people that do it and I trust them. Okay, so here is lead 210, and, and um, Sean, Sean can explain it when, we're, when we do the, the panel. So lead 210, so you've got the uranium thorium radioactive series going to radium, uh, some radon gets up into the sky, and it turns into lead 210, and some of it rains out and it's sticky. And here's a soil profile showing the more of it sticks near the surface, less down below. Beryllium-10, you have an innocent oxygen uh, atom up in the sky. It gets zapped by cosmic rays. And one of the byproducts is beryllium-10. It rains out, and it sticks to the soil. One of the really cool things is this actually tells you, you can use this to tell how fast uh, erosion is happening. Uh, people use this in the, in the mountains all the time. Okay, so this is, the, this is one of our surface fingerprints. And then an important thing to note is the very different half-life, that period of time over which half of the, uh, the uh, radioactive uh, radioactivity is, is gone. 22 years versus one and a half million years. That's going to be important, both pieces together. Okay, so up here on the fields, high in beryllium-10, high in lead-210, because this junk is raining out on it. Over here, in the peaks of the lower Lassure, we've got, you know, it's low in any of these uh, surface fingerprints. The reason why we like both of them is that sediment is deposited. If it came from the field in 1880, or 1900, or 1920, and then it rested for a while in the floodplain, 40, 50 years, half-life of lead 210, 22 years, it's pretty much dead. Beryllium 10, forget about it. And that's one and a half million years. Okay, so we can actually use both of them to say something about the storage and movement of sediment through the, uh, uh, through the watershed. Here's where we do that. We come back to the iconic I think I will always call it the iconic angstrom plot. Um, okay, so here is the increase in sedimentation. The X's are lead 210. The red dots are beryllium. If it has a high amount, that means it came from uh, the surface. It came from soils. Deep here in the background, well, 1500, we could only use beryllium. Lead 210 would be dead. Okay, it's a small number. Both of them increase as we move into the 20th century and max out, and then both of them decrease. And notice that they're decreasing while the total rate of sedimentation remains high. Okay, another unexpected result. And what it's saying is in the pre-settlement, before agriculture, there wasn't much sediment coming out, and it was mostly stream banks and bluffs and things like that. That's the geologically prime part of the watershed. Late 19th, mid 20th century, before modern soil conservation, dust bowl, all that good stuff, okay? Most of the erosion, the erosion uh, hit a peak, and most of it was from the soils, okay? But then the soil erosion dropped off, the total didn't. didn't decrease. Why would that be? How would we explain that? How would we use that to take action? Okay, uh, we will get there. The sediment budget together with the, uh, the fact that we have Lake Pepin and we can track the rate of sedimentation together with the fingerprinting put together a remarkable story of uh, a, an enormous watershed over a large period of time. So what's going on here? The delivery of sediment to Lake Pepin is still at a high rate, much, much more than background, but the dominant shore for, sh source has shifted. Uh, this uh, focuses our attention um, on uh, another mechanism. Well, river flow has increased. So this is a plot uh, from the 30s to the present. This is flow normalized by its value back in I think it was 1935, and these are statistics for 12 gauges, all of which are in the Minnesota River Basin. 
12 long running gauges, annual flow, peak flows, low flows, high and extreme flow, they're all going up. There's more flow in the rivers. Okay. How does that increased flow uh, contribute to sediment supply? Again, the stream gauging effort bails us out, the upstream and downstream gauges. This illustrates the Maple River. So here's the upstream gauge. We go down into the incised zone, and there's the lower gauge. Uh, this, this river is hemmed in by the Cobb and by the Blue Earth. It's got no watershed down there, but it picks up you know, from 8,000 to 24,000 tons per year. Okay, that it picks up along that, that way. Uh, so a student of mine uh, at Hopkins uh, looked at not only the Cobb, Maple, Lesseur, but you may recall the Rush and High, uh, uh, High Island and Seven Mile on the other side of the Minnesota. All of these are scale, but what we're seeing is the rate of sediment input from the incised zone is basically nil. What comes by the upper gauge is the same as what goes by the lower gauge until we pass a threshold and then boom, it takes off. Okay, the amount of sediment being increased, uh, being added flowing through the inside zone goes way up. Okay, so more peak flows, more sediment added. So why is the river flow going up? You may ask. Well, unfortunately, there are three reasons. It's raining more. Uh, in some subwatersheds, there's been a shift in cropping. Uh, this green here is for uh, small grains and forage. And uh, in the Blue Earth watershed, you can see that that's pinched out, replaced by soybeans. Okay, soybeans uh, 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 begin to um, uh, use water later in the year um, uh, than uh, the small grains, and so this can increase the flow, particularly in the spring. And then drainage upgrades. So I thought, growing up, that you know some Civil War veteran came back, put in some clay tiles in the field, and it was once and done. Little did I know that it's deeper, faster, uh, um, um, all, all the way along, and that drainage upgrades are proceeding apace. Um, someone last night even said that sometimes when Farmers rent land for a certain number of years. They will pay to put in uh, uh, improved drainage. This is a piece of the Lassur. The green and the brown are farmed land. The brown is, is um, uh, uh, poorly drained land. And then the, the black contours are actually depressions, uh, in internally drained areas. And this piece of it is actually captured over here in the same picture you saw below before with the, uh, with, with the pattern. Uh, tiling. So it's raining more. We have a shift in crops that uh, have less ET in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, May and June period, and we're draining more. Okay, so it's a hard problem to, to uh, figure out. There've only, there have not been many attempts to do this. One of them was led by Sean uh, Schottler. This is, um, these are Drainages, the names down here are the same up here. Here's the Blue Earth, six over is the Lassur. And what we have here is water yield in millimeters. Down here is runoff ratio, the, the change in runoff ratio, the fraction of precipitation that runs off. And in the middle is the change in precipitation. And it's done for May, June, September, October. It turns out that none of these have a really significant change in precipitation in the May, June period. But notice an enormous change in runoff, uh, in, in water yield and runoff ratio during that period. Okay. Interestingly, some of these uh, don't have a change, and, and some of these sub-watersheds do, suggesting it isn't a broad brush change in precipitation across all of southern Minnesota, but something local like land use would be uh, important. And this is what they tried to work out in this uh, uh, in this paper where they uh, accounted for crop conversion and precipitation, and then they uh, attributed the remainder to increases in drainage. As you shift to, to corn and beans, uh, the, the benefit of productivity from drainage uh, uh, increases. 
The clear message here is that it is not only increases in precipitation. One could make the argument that it's raining more and the river flow has gone up, and one could show a positive correlation, and that would be convincing enough. But one would only be choosing certain parts of the data and not considering all of the different things that might contribute to how much uh, 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 might uh, run off, and I think not contributing to um, uh, resolving the issue. So 9 and 10, near channel sediment supply has increased along with peak river discharges, and those peaks are due to an increase in precipitation, an inc a shift in crops, and uh, ever-increasing uh, uh, um, field drainage. So um, there's the 10 points. I'm not, there's, only, there's more than one more slide. We're not entirely done. But these are the things that I think are true and those things that uh, we shouldn't have to argue about. And if you're a Lake Pepin fan, the rain is going up, the river is getting muddier, um, uh, the rate of sedimentation remains high. Um, and so uh, inspired by my, my favorite uh, uh, radio personality uh, from the state of Minnesota, we have Lake Wilbegon. Well, all the fields are drained, all the rivers are muddy, and all the rain is above average. This is what I do when in lieu of work sometimes. Um, OK, why has the river discharge increased? These are the three reasons. A number of people have, have said that, uh, have concluded that um, uh, the increased runoff can be primarily attributed to uh, row crop conversions uh, and drainage. But, and there are some in the agribusiness community that struggle with this message. Okay, and one thing we can say is well, do we actually need to definitively resolve all of this in order to take action? There's too much water in the rivers, there's too much peak flow, it's eroding the bluffs, the bluffs are falling in. And that's a problem if you want to reduce the turbidity. Okay? If we want to reduce the loading, we have to reduce the peak flows, and that requires hold, holding water high in the, in, in the watershed. So how do we get now to the social part about what are we going to do about this? Um, the science is uncertain. We can't, I mean, sediment erosion is a highly local, highly episodic process. You can't predict it everywhere at all times. But hopefully I've convinced you that uh, using a range of evidence and lots of good gauges, we can tell the story in broad outline form with a, with, with a reasonable degree of confidence. Okay, Emphasizing that you know we're looking for the best explanation that accounts for all observations and their uh, uncertainty and thinking hard about how we take measurements in some place and scale them up. See sediment budget, mass balance, see sediment fingerprinting and explaining uh, the proportion of the different sources um, uh, that we see in Lake Pepin. So then how do we put this to work and how do we transfer this information to those who would make decisions and those who would take action? Um, this is just a sampling of the, uh, um, you know, some of the headlines. You know, I have to say for a guy from Baltimore, which is, I'm still pretty much a Baltimore, I mean, this is pretty tame stuff, right? I mean, imagine that this was, river was in New Jersey, right? I mean, there, there'd be people shutting down traffic, uh, all the highways in the Twin Cities. Um, but anyway, um, you know, it, it's been a debate. Hard decisions will have to be made. Lots of money will be spent. Choices will have to be made as to where to spend that. The thing that is important to me is to make sure that the, the message from science is as clear as possible. If we're arguing about the science, then it's going to be all the harder to make the right decisions at a policy level or at a, at, at, at a local level. And that's what we're trying to work towards. Okay? You bring together your stakeholders. 
they have their concerns. You look for what's common. Over here in blue, you do what you can to understand the system. Link cause and effect. Explain how things work. And then the two of them together uh, allow those who need to make a decision to make a decision. If people don't want to get along, you can't stop them. If people have a mind to, and I think Minnesotans have a mind to, solve this problem in the Minnesota, um, uh, I think that this can be done. So we're trying to do that. Uh, we're working just in the blue earth. So that's the Lesur, the blue earth, and the Watanwan. But again, that's the beating muddy heart of the watershed. Uh, we have de developed a collaborative. Um, uh, PCA and ag uh, money from uh, the Clean Water Land and Legacy Act, 319 money through PCA from EPA and also from the ag industry itself. Those who could had to pay to play. Okay, We're developing a simulation model. We're trying to predict where the sediment's coming from, how it's moving through the, uh, uh, the blue earth, and then putting that in a decision analysis system where we can evaluate costs and, and um, um, uh, benefits of management alternatives. And the goal is a consensus strategy. Can all the different players, uh, or players representing all the different interests, agree that, yeah, you know, that's probably the best thing to do, or that's the best thing to do, but it ain't going to happen, and here's the second best thing to do. Can we, can we get to that kind of information? Okay, so the first thing we did um, is we had a sediment budget for the Lesur, and now we've ramped it up to the Blue Earth. Here's the numbers. Brown is bluffs. Uh, blue is stream banks. A lot of sediment is coming out of the stream banks because the flow is going up and the streams are getting wider. Okay, and that's a source of sediment. The green is the fields. Okay, so we have an idea where the stuff is coming from. And then uh, uh, we develop uh, uh, options and we build a simulation model. That's a whole nother talk, even more interesting than this one. Uh, how do you go about modeling? a big watershed like this. Our approach is quite a bit different. Our, our model is quite a bit simpler. But it, by being simpler, it is able to take advantage of all of this different kind of information that's available. It's nimble and robust, or at least I hope it will be when we're finally uh, finished with it. I mean, we, you take actions on the field, tillage, soil retention, and then there's a way to, to discount that sediment uh, reduction as it moves all the way through the watershed, some of it storing along the way. You can protect some bluffs, primarily by protecting their toe from erosion. Okay, If the toe doesn't erode anymore, the bluff might erode some, but it's going to be laying back and it'll eventually uh, run out of sediment. Okay, And holding water high in the watershed such that the, uh, the peak flows are smaller in the inside zone, so that uh, the loading will, will uh, uh, go down. Um, we are just at the point uh, where our next meeting with the stakeholders, which will be next summer, we will have the simulation model uh, uh, complete. We were previewing it last Friday with uh, uh, a meeting down in Mankato. Um, I wanted to say something about what we should do. and. <clears throat> These things seem pretty obvious. Whole water higher in the watershed. I'm a little embarrassed. Some people, uh, uh, this has been perfectly clear to, and they've been very eloquent. Uh, Al Keen at the Bureau of Water and Soil Resources is the main one that comes to mind. Yeah, we've got to store some water. We've got to store it high in the watershed so we reduce the storm flows and the sediment supply from the inside zone. Presumably in the implementation, Things like pheasants and deer and whatnot will also be accommodated. Those bluffs and ravines that threaten infrastructure, let's, let's, let's patch them. I mean, if the infrastructure is worth saving. Um, it's easy to reduce sediment loading by hardening the bluffs. That's putting a Band-Aid on the problem and not curing the, the, uh, the illness. Okay, but those places where there is an, an independent reason, there's a bridge washing out, there's a, there's a house falling in, then that's a good way to uh, get some sediment reduction easily. 
And importantly, let's combine these in a way that we can actually measure, you know, th that we took these actions and we could, we could actually measure the reductions. And we can use that information for better planning into the future. So to me, the Minnesota River Basin is, in the end, a grand social experiment. Around the world, and certainly across the country, we have a tension between water use um, and agriculture, OK? Um, and dealing with the sediment, the turbidity, the nutrients that come from row crop uh, agriculture. All of you know that. The other thing you know is that politics in Minnesota is sometimes amusing, at least to those of us not in Minnesota watching from other places. I mean, you elect some curious governors and, you know, on, on and on it goes. But you know what? Again, you did this unusual thing, saying here's a lot of money for clean water. A lot of money. Okay, and then there was this uh, surprise of the dates off the bottom. It was uh, the 16th. It was a few days ago where your governor said, you know what? Let's put buffers everywhere. Okay, um, my uh, finding on, that, on the buffers, uh, yes, great idea. It helps keep sediment out of the waterways. But those buffers that provide a water storage function provide some floodplains, provide some bigger ditches where you can store floodwaters, keep them up higher, reduce the peak flows going through the inside zone. Those are the ones that are, that are, are really going to help uh, uh, the Minnesota. So I think because it's in one state, and because that state is Minnesota, and because the land use is so uniform, I think the Minnesota River Basin is a great opportunity to solve for the first time and in a very a transparent way, this difficult problem of non-point pollution. That's what I've got. Thanks for your attention. I didn't Thanks. give you any warning, did I? <laughs> Thank you, Peter. That was great. So if the panelists can start coming up to the stage, we'll uh, proceed with the um, discussion with the expertise in the room, which is many. And again, thanks for all of you for coming and um, showing your support to this important problem. And again, Peter, for his great work in the Minnesota River Basin. So our guest tonight, um, and, and you guys know the, the drill here is the cards have been passed around. So if you can start put passing the cards towards the aisles, um, someone will be there to pick them up. And we'll bring those questions forward and, um, and give the panelists your, your thoughts and questions. So um, this evening, I'm going to begin with uh, Carrie Jennin Jennings. She's a, a geologist at the Department of Natural Resources and Echo Waters Division. Uh, prior to that, she was a geologist for 22 years at the Minnesota Geological Survey, part of uh, the School of Earth Sciences at the University of Minnesota. And while there, she conducted some of the primary research on geologic mapping. And she has mapped the surficial geology of half the state. I guess that's the geology of the surface of half the state. She has taught at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Um, her field-oriented glacial geology class at the University of Minnesota has been offered for the last 20 years, and Kiri applies her understanding of landscape evolution to show how modern rivers are still responding to late glacial events. Thanks for being here. Our next uh, panelist, Sean Schottler, is a senior scientist at the St. Croix Watershed Research Station, a field station of the Science Museum of Minnesota. He received his Ph.D. in environmental engineering from the University of Minnesota in 1997. His principal research interests focus on quantifying the impacts of land use on water quality and sediment erosion in agricultural watersheds. His current research projects include use of the radioisotopes to fingerprint sources of sediment that we just heard about in large agricultural rivers, measuring the impact of 
retired grasslands, such as the Conservation Research Program on reducing sediment and phosphorus inputs to lakes, and the potential for artificial drainage to increase the erosivity of rivers. And finally, Paul Nelson at the far end. He currently serves as the Environmental Services Program Manager for Scott County. In this capacity, he manages all the environmental programs in the county, including Watershed Organization Administration, and works closely with the Scott Soil and Water Conservation District. He obtained his Master's in Forestry and Agricultural Engineering from North Carolina State University and has over 25 years' experience in water resource management. At Scott County, he has led the development of and implemented a number of near channel sediment control efforts along Sand Creek and Credit River, which are tributaries to the, tributaries to the Minnesota River. Thanks again for all of you coming tonight. And we usually start this off by um, getting a response of each one of you to the talk we just heard from Peter. Um, so, uh, Carrie, should I start with you? Sure. I just wanted, to, are these on? Can you hear me? I just wanted to add one more name to the list of people that Peter thanked because the original person that brought this problem to my attention was Chuck Regan at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, somebody I went to graduate school with here, and he said, we have this problem with sediment. It's a geologic problem, isn't it? And I'm often quick to admit it's not only geologic but glacial geology that is at the root of these things. And I think sometimes geologists might take a frustratingly long view of a system and, you know, this is just a blip in time and just wait and it'll change. But in this case, you know, the issues in the rivers and also the hazards that are associated with bluff retreat were real and relevant to this work. And Chuck asked the question, he said, who can work on this? And I knew about and said at least, the group at the University of Minnesota, and I'm really happy that Peter led this, um, this work, and we're lucky to have had this focus. Um, so I, I'm familiar with everything until the very end for the talk. Um, this was, it's an exciting development that they're expanding what they understand in the Lesur watershed now to the greater Blue Earth watershed. And I think that the social piece is a really important one that as a geologist I wouldn't have thought to bring in. We might just go out and keep telling the geologic story again and again and hope that somebody latches on to it. But I think that social part is really very important. Um, first of all, I just have to compliment you, Peter. That was an excellent summary of the state of the knowledge on understanding sediment erosion in a very erosive watershed. And he did an excellent job. And it was, um, I guess I have to say it was factually correct as well. I'm familiar with <laughs> what's in there, so. Um, and uh, i just like to expand a little bit. Um, Peter and his group, and I, I know all of them well, sort of carved out that territory in the Blue Earth and Lesur, and that's where we were working, and we've now moved out of there into broader parts of the state working in lakes and um, using many of the same tools to understand erosion on a much smaller watershed scale. And Minnesota is an unusual state. Not only does it have the Blue Earth Lesur system, which is eroding at you know, world-renowned rates? But we have Lake Pepin, which allowed us to reconstruct the background, the natural conditions, which is very unusual. And every lake in the state is a potential archive of sediment erosion histories. And what happens in each lake's watershed is a little different. So we can do a lot of comparative work of why is, why is the sediment erosion rate here higher or lower and so on? And that's what we're doing now. And one of the findings that we're seeing, particularly in the ag watersheds, is that sediment erosion rates are not coming down, um, often in, su in surprising fashion. Places where we thought they should have come down, they're not. And we don't have the answer of why on that. And there's still, despite all the work that's been going on, there's still a lot to learn on sediment erosion and how we can manage it and what activities, best management practices we can do. Cool. Thank you. Again, as I listened to this, I could relate a lot of this that Peter talked about to my experience on Sand Creek and also on the Credit River that I have in Scott County to work on. 
I'm one of those people that he talked about that doesn't necessarily wait till the science and the dust settles. I like to, like to act. And so we've done a number of things. We basically follow the formula that was given at the end of, of trying to slow some of the runoff down, working on the near channel sediment sources that are at risk to infrastructure. I'll tell you, though, that um, working the upstream for runoff reduction is very difficult, partly because people are visual. What I've noticed is people can look out and they can see erosion. They can say, aha, that's a problem. But looking at a field that used to store water that now doesn't isn't a visual thing that sort of connects with them. So we really need to figure out, uh, I think to a large extent, how to make this locally relevant to people in their, in their fields, in their own landscape, in their own backyard. That's my experience and uh, what I had to add. All right. So I'm going to um, ask again for those of you who, who have thought of questions subsequently, we have a few questions here. I want to encourage you to ask for a card and, and come up with some challenges for our panelists here. Um, maybe I'll start with one, and this might um, reflect my naivete. Um, I'm in the molecular space, and when I think about sedimentation, I think about Svedberg's equation about how fast a protein moves through sucrose or solutions as opposed to the sinking of sand. But it seems to me that in terms of the overall watershed, the surface water that you're referring to in the lakes and the river is a fairly minor portion of the, the watershed. Is that inaccurate? And if it's not inaccurate in terms of the water below the land, how, how, does, how does that play in terms of water quality issues when it's a minor component of what we're looking at in terms of where water comes from? Mm. Ooh, I'm still on. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'll just um, you can add to it, but one of the things I would point out, and it's often underappreciated by my mom, <laughs> is that most of the water that falls on the state goes back up in evapotranspiration. And you say, okay, so what? A lot of the things that we do on the landscape change evapotranspiration, drainage and crop conversion being two of those. And so if we do things on a landscape scale like drainage and crop conversion that change the largest portion of the hydrologic budget, ET, we're going to have a big effect on hydrology and then the water goes into the river and widens the rivers and so on, and Peter's story. And so I think that that's a really underappreciated part of that equation for the public. Uh, the piece I would add is, is that um, in some ways the, uh, the current sediment story, which is uh, being driven by high river flows, it, uh, is, is similar to the urban runoff story where more water runs off in storms, you get bigger volumes and, and, and higher peaks because the current primary source of sediment is driven by those highest flows. If we could keep more water higher in the landscape and send more to the groundwater or send more to evapotranspiration, we would be cutting down those peaks and therefore cutting down that sediment supply. And I would add, it seems you I think we also think, you're the biologist, right? We also think about the ecosystems that are in the surface water. So it is affecting all surface water ecosystems. And at the same time, what we're doing potentially with tiling, and this is still an unanswered question, is intercepting water that could potentially be replenishing the groundwater. So we don't know right now. Nobody's monitoring those changes. So we don't know what the long-term effect on water storage in the groundwater system is going to be. But in terms of the other sources of non-point source contamination, the sediment problem isn't really reflecting the behavior of those contaminants, is it? It's certainly some of the contaminants sorb to the sediment. Um, my, my sophisticated understanding is that sediment and phosphorus are fellow travelers. And uh, it's, it's, uh, Jacques Finley always assures me it's more complicated than that. but. <laughs> That's not bad for a first, uh, for a start, uh, and and nitrogen is, is is much more difficult, and uh, would be moving more with the water, would depend more on residence time, 
in different places within the watershed. Okay, so moving on to audience questions here. Um, how might changes in crop selection from soybeans help reduce runoff? I think the, the question is really how much can it really help the problem? A lot. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Come on. That's, um, <laughs> for my colleagues, they may recognize that that's from Monty Python's Life of Brian. <laughs> so the question of how much do you hate the Romans? A lot. Um, yeah. We, I mean, it's, it's not a one, it's not a one size fits all, but we, we had a third of the landscape growing crops that were sucking up water in May and June, which are critical months. And that portion of the hydrologic budget is very large. So if we encourage crops on the landscape that are both perennial and or growing early in the season, we have the potential to use up a lot of water. And there is an initiative in the state not only to look at alternative crops, perennials and so on, but also continuous living cover. You know, there's an effort to seed other crops into corn and soybeans so that there's something green and growing in the spring. Um, so as we look at you know, decisions that we can make to change both hydrology, phosphorus runoff, sediment runoff, looking at things that change cropping patterns is a fruitful endeavor. So Paul, I'll direct this one to you. So how, how fast would you expect the response of reduced erosion from, reduced, from reducing the peak flows? I was actually going to ask that question. <laughs> 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 I, I don't. I don't have it. Years, idea, and it's what keeps me awake at night. Actually, um, years, decades, or centuries? Um, probably closer to centuries. Um, depending on what's going on. And, and last week, I gave a very brief talk about two different watersheds. One being the Credit River and, and Sand Creek. Sand Creek is, is was one of the red watersheds that you saw up there. And Sand Creek is largely agriculture, and land use is not changing. And um, we had over time, we've put in many, many practices with landowners and, and producers. And uh, suspended sediment was going down over a 20-year period about 18 uh, percent. And then the last three years, we've had these extreme rains and mobilized a lot of sediment, and that all, all washed away in the trend analysis. Credit River, on the other hand, is basically converted over the last 20 years from agriculture to urban where you have perennial vegetation, and over that same 20-year period, it's gone down 60%. So there is some hope. Uh, and the difference is the, the suspended solids concentration in a 20-year period. Uh, but it's been very, you know, and if most of you know, City of Savage in that area was the fastest growing area in the country in the late 90s and early 2000s. So um, just that conversion over from seasonally vegetation to perennial vegetation, along with some very large uh, regional parks and, and other types of things that have gone on in that watershed have made a difference in decades. But other places, it'll take centuries, I think. Other thoughts? Yeah, because it really is a question of where you look. If you're looking in the streams that lead to the Minnesota River if their suspended sediment is decreasing. That doesn't mean that the water is decreasing. That doesn't mean that the erosion downstream is decreasing. And that doesn't address any storage in the system. So you really have to take the pulse in a lot of places to figure it out. And when I try to get this point across to people, I show kind of a disgusting slide of a python swallowing something large, like a kangaroo. You know, we put a lot of sediment into this river system and we've just clogged the main artery with all the sediment. And I think it's a really interesting but difficult question to say how long it will take that system, that pulse, to move through the system. Uh, <clears throat> picking up on a point that Paul made earlier, uh, people respond to what they can see, and they see erosion. They'd like to fix it. Um, one of the challenges with reducing uh, uh, flows in the river is, uh, I mean, we can, we, it, it's clear that we can connect high flows to increase sediment loading, but we're not treating the thing itself. We're treating uh, uh, what is probably the cause higher up in the watershed. Uh, that takes patience and it, and it takes time. 
and actually it takes something like the, I think you know, a group like the Freshwater Society to to make that that message uh, um, uh, very clear. But the um, the Credit River story, that's a great one. I I, I did not um, um, I did not know that. I, the the simple empirical relation we have for the source of sediment within the incised zone, um, you know, if you if you take uh, the peak flows in a given year and they go from, you know, 2,000 cubic feet per second down to 1,500 cubic feet per second, I think that there will be a, a very measurable decrease in the sediment supply. Um, but it's a, you know, the, the peak runoffs are a uh, stochastic weather-like thing that's hard to predict in any detail. So this sort of falls into the category, I guess, of, of ways in which you might trap the water higher up um, and ask the question about are there structures that can be added to the drain tile systems in order to, to increase water storage? Al Keen may be coming up here, but we can talk about there is drainage water management types of things where if your landscape is rather flat, you can actually use the tile systems to, to uh, drain during some parts of the year and suddenly irrigate in other parts of the year. Um, in our watersheds, the topography is a little bit too, too steep for some of that. And what we're having major success with right now is converting over smaller parcels that are not large production agriculture over into native grasses. Um, that fits well with rural residential uh, parcels in the five, 10 acre range. We've had very limited success with um, creating ponding areas uh, or wetland restoration. Uh, anything in our area that has uh, requirements for uh, perpetual easements is pretty much uh, sunk. Um, some of that may have been the development back when that was hot, people thought their land was going to be developed and they don't want any kind of encumbrances on it. So we find that relatively difficult. Uh, we can get things put in with, with new development. That's part of having rules. So when the land use is changing, that's actually an opportunity as part of the Credit River success to, to have those standards in place and do that. And this question alludes, I guess, to a... Can I just... Yeah, yeah absolutely. That, just yep. to, it's, the thing to, to bear in mind on that is the scale. And you saw those, the pictures that Peter showed of the alterations that we've done to the hydrology and landscape, you know, principally thinking of draining the wetlands and subsurface tile drainage. It's enormous. And we altered the entire landscape to create the change in hydrology that we have. In order to go back, we have to put on similar scale changes to get the change in hydrology we want. And the system currently heavily rewards us to drain it. We, we do not want a wet landscape. It does not produce the same corn and soybean yields that a drier landscape does. And there's an enormous incentive to a farmer to drain the landscape. And unless we change that, it, it, we're going to be paddling upstream the whole way to get a landscape scale change. So unless we change, unless we change what? The incentives. The incentives? Crop insurance might be one part of yeah. that, that they have their risk covered to plant land that's somewhat marginal. Well, and you're rewarded for yield. And so the higher your yields, the greater you're going to get your payment, the greater you um, secure yourself against failure. And, and that's what drives the system right now, to think that we're going to go out there and put control structures on the landscape that we have to pay for every one of them and get the change in hydrology that we want, I would personally say I think is rather unlikely. We need to couple it with changes in our policy. So in just a, um, a small extension of that, so it was mentioned that row crop farming isn't possible without tiling. To what extent is that true? None. Not as possible? <laughs> My grandpa grew corn and soybeans without any tiling. No, we can grow crops without tiling. We can't meet the yields. That's what the big thing is. I mean, every farmer will tell you the best dollar spent on the farm is to put in tile drainage if you have poorly drained landscape. It's to make more money. We can grow crops 
without any drainage, different crops, and we can grow the same crops without drainage. We can't grow them as much, we can't make as much money, we can't be as efficient, we can't allocate the commodity in the same way. It's about how we do it, not if we can do it. And less of the total area in the Minnesota watershed would be devoted to crops because approximately, because of DNR work and the work of Marshner, the pre-settlement vegetation is known fairly well and about 30 percent of that watershed was wetland. So that would be taken out of the story. Yeah, probably a lot of it. <laughs> so this is a fairly targeted one. <laughs> Sean Sauter said, stated last week that we cannot make a big change in sediment without a change in crop cover, especially in the spring. Can we store enough water without a major change in land cover? I guess that's you. Me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what I said was, and I'm going to try to look it up. <laughs> I'm going to, you know, if that there's been a lot of efforts done, a lot of modeling efforts that have looked at the various scenarios that we can do for conservation practices, best management practices, and the dollars that some of those would cost if what we're given is the crop rotation that we're going to have in the state of Minnesota is corn and soybeans. If that's what we're limited to, corn and beans, and the profitability of corn and beans, we probably cannot construct a reasonable set of best management practices for a reasonable amount of money to get out of this, this problem. And until we start making other crops profitable, that talk was about making other crops profitable so that we can create an incentive for a landscape scale change, I, I find it difficult to find a set of solutions that works. And I, I hate to be negative about it, but I think we also have to be realistic. And this was in the context of the legacy amendment, where there's another 20 years left. After 25 years, how much cleaner will our water be? And, you know, we're we're seeing the future, which is we're not going to hit our water quality objectives with the current agri practices that we're restricted to. But is that um, working, uh, is that having crops on the same area that's currently farmed? I mean, what, what if we continue to grow corn and beans but on a smaller area and take out of production some of the most uh, least well-drained Soils. Well, actually, this was, and this one specifically was identifying, replacing, converting some of the corn acreage to alfalfa or perennials. So it would be the same total land in agriculture, it would just be a different form of agriculture. And this one was designed saying we're going to produce the same number of calories, we'll produce the same beef, we're just going to do it in a different way. And um, at, at the same time, we're not done tiling. The tiling is not only doing wet areas, it's doing all areas, mm -hmm. even areas that are irrigated. So, you know, Iowa claim, a soil scientist in Iowa claimed that they were done. That might be a place to see what the long-term effect will be. But we're still increasing the area that's drained. The, we, we often don't think of it down here, but the Red River Basin is going through what the Minnesota River Basin has gone through over the last 50 years. In the Red River Basin in 1980, there was almost no soybeans grown. The Red River Basin will now be this year, I don't know, roughly 50% soybeans, an enormous crop conversion. And, oh, Al Keynes here, he knows, probably knows the number. In the Boise du Sioux watershed in the last five years, they put in a million miles of tile. Would that be about right? The big number. <laughs> you know, so they're... They're undergoing a, an enormous landscape conversion there that we kind of know what we would predict for some of the outcomes. Except they don't have the slope driving it, and they don't have the river history driving it. I'm, I'm also thinking of nitrate and phosphorus yeah. as well. Yeah, true. Right. This question goes towards, the, I guess, the technology of um, involved with modeling these systems, and will the technology of modeling or the computational models be able to uh, predict or define the effects of uh, soil organic matter management and associated soil water holding capacity on peak flows and erosion? <clears throat> the model that we're building would use that information rather than predict that information. I mean, the, 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 the model that we're uh, uh, building is um, uh, there's been a trend over the last 50 years to build more and more complicated, more and more highly resolved models that inclu include 
uh, more and more processes. Um, and uh, we're striking out in a new direction where we take information that may be independently modeled, hopefully measured with multiple lines of evidence, and we're building a simpler model that simply adds things up. So that if there is a, a, a practice that um, uh, changes the organic matter content of the fields and that produces a change in a unit erosion rate, that's something that we would use. But it's certainly not something we're trying to predict. Uh, we've, we've found in general that the more complicated models have become, the more fragile they are and the more sensitive they are to having to, to have all the inputs correct. So I guess the answer is no. <laughs> but that would, I mean, but wouldn't that ultimately be the goal? To be able to know what you could change and, if, and, and affect? Um, well, our, our, our goal will focus on um, the relative benefits of, in terms of location within the watershed, uh, particularly whether you're far from the outlet or, or closer to it or within the inside zone of actions that would store water or actions that would keep more soil on the field or actions that would trap soil on the field and prevent uh, gullies and things like that uh, from happening. But we're, we're, we're not trying to predict any one of those. We would, we would use that as input. And if you think about the timing of the water storage, you need it in May and June, and that's precisely when you probably have waterlogged conditions at the surface and you have um, tiles that you don't want to plug up. So it's kind of critical to store it at those particular times. This is just, uh, I'll throw a rule of thumb. <coughs> building soil organic matter is a great way to you know, um, also alter hydrology. I think the rule of thumb is Every increase of 1% in soil organic matter gives you another inch of water holding capacity in the soil. And an inch of water holding capacity is a very big number. You build organic matter, one, one of the ways you build organic matter is through no-till agriculture. It's very slow. It takes a long time to build 1% organic matter. But if we want, I don't need a model to make one of the predictions, which is we are about to embark on harvesting most of that organic matter from the fields to satisfy our cellulosic ethanol needs. And I think we need to be aware that you know, we're going to produce more ethanol out of cellulose in the future, according to the renewable fuels mandate, and we're going to get that by harvesting the organic matter from the fields, the corn stover. Is, is that a wise choice? So the um, so when you when you raise those kinds of uh, methods that would improve water holding capacity, are we being realistic at all? Are there are there ways in which you can actually affect those sorts of changes in the way farmers proceed? The the farmers will do whatever makes money. Right, but presently that's not going to that, that's no. not going to be a solution in terms of productivity. Um, the 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 ethanol one, and you know, I'm I'm not an expert on it, but th that's a choice that we make by the policy and the laws that we pass. Yeah. I mean, it's already a mandate. Farmers didn't say, "Yeah, here's let's make ethanol." There was a mandate, right. and the cellulosic portion of the of the renewable fuel standard is a mandate. We could require what we choose to make the ethanol from. You know, that's a choice. Um, we're going to make it out of corn stover because it's easy, but we don't have to. Mm. And, you know, other crops that we grow in the landscape, it's a matter of whether or not we create the markets for them. Let me add a little bit to that in terms of uh, the whole initiative for cover crops. Uh, we've been working with our, our producers. We actually had a workshop this summer to introduce the topic, and, and we found that we, we had to call and, and kind of beg some people to come. Most of the attendees were, were agency people. Um, that said, it does have traction in the south. It's going to be slower here because of our, our growing seasons in terms of, of getting something like that established. It's also a little bit more established for um, the, you know, the cash crops for, for vegetables and stuff like that where it's harvested early versus I, my understanding is that, that NRCS 
does not really have it established as something to do with the corn bean rotation right now. So we are we are you know promoting it with our producers. Probably it's going to take an incentive payment. Um, or in the case of Scott County where we've been recently acquiring land for parks and we still haven't developed those parks and we're renting some of that land, we'll make it as part of our contracts. And so we will be getting people to do it by trial and error to find some of the right mixes and stuff for those areas in the corn bean rotation that haven't really been fleshed out yet. Okay, this question says, Des Moines Waterworks intends to sue ditch authorities in rural counties upstream of its intake. Do you think it will get legal <laughs> over sediment delivery or excess flow? Is this going to become a legal battle? We have, well, fortunately, we have no experts on that here, but um, <laughs> I can, <laughs> having hung around with uh, environmental engineers for a quarter of a century, I know that um, uh, turbidity, suspended solids in, in source water, is uh, a major part of the water treatment process. And probably the most important or risky thing is, is when um, the amount of suspended solids is uh, uncertain, where you don't know what's going to be coming and is this going to be a big dump that you're, uh, uh, that you're going to have to deal with because you have to adjust your treatment process and that introduces the, the potential for um, um, uh, making mistakes. Uh, so... Um, I think the question was actually larger than that. Was, you know, that's a nitrogen question and it got legal in Des Moines, but will the sediment question in Minnesota become a legal yes. question, not just for water treatment, but for just oh, well. aquatic life, landslide hazards? I think that was the question. Oh, well, I'm not going to touch <laughs> Any that. lawyers in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> it's a heck of a way to run the environment, you know, through the, through the courts. But, yeah, let's just clean it up. So you alluded to um, Governor Dayton's proposed 50-foot uh, buffers um, to be placed around all the state's waters. Um, what might this mean if it actually gets implemented and enforced? Well, it's already on the books. It should be being done now. It's just not enforced, I believe. Uh, he expanded. It, you, he did expand. Uh, okay. Wider in some places. Um, uh, as I mentioned at the end, uh, in the context of the Minnesota, where high flows are producing the largest sediment source, those uh, buffer actions that help to store water rather than simply filter out uh, sediment and other things uh, would be uh, the most, the greatest benefit. That said, uh, uh, you know, field sources are still roughly a quarter of the, of the sediment supply coming out. Buffers are good at removing uh, sediment that is coming off of fields, and so um, it, it would be a benefit either way. But um, I think that the, the focus and the investment needs to be on water storage. Let me add to that a little bit as a county perspective um, and the water management there. I, I love buffers, and part of our, one of our main emphasis has been the whole promotion of buffers and improving riparian corridors and, and so forth. And in fact, we've kind of looked at the, the buffer requirements as they are now, and we, we have, I think, about a 90% compliance or, or better. What I'm torn a little bit about is, is going after that remaining 10% when the, the buffer rule right now only applies to certain waters. And where we work with the producers a lot of times is on the smaller drainage ways. And there's much more of those and many more miles of those. So do I take the risk uh, of going after that remaining 10% and reducing the amount of comply or cooperation I have on other programs that, that we have? So that's one of the considerations that we have. But otherwise, I love the idea particularly since, from my understanding, the proposal of the DNR would enforce it instead of the counties. <laughs> so going in a little bit different direction here, um, would there be a reason to propose long-term, that is decades, 
studies on water, of watersheds that include social elements? Yes, they should be decades long with lots of funding and come to the research station. <laughs> this is in the land of 10,000 erosion rates. <laughs> may, may I tell a little story? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, when we, we finished spending about $600,000 on traditional study stuff and we thought that we had found out what the answer was, uh, we then rolled that out to folks that, that we wanted to do along Sand Creek and other creeks a lot of stuff along the corridors with buffers, with riparian, improving riparian vegetation and so forth. And we had identified all around 200 different projects that, that we could do to improve the corridor, both from some were deer channel sediment projects, others, like I said, were just riparian types of things. And we contacted uh, about half of those 200 landowners as priority projects, and about half of them uh, actually came in and met with us, which we thought was great success to have about 50% people come in and, and meet with you when we said we found a problem, we'd like to talk to you about it. Um, but of those 50 that did come in, not a single one of them was where we were improving the vegetation. They were all the visual ones where we had erosion types of things. Um, instead of, uh, it just did not, vegetation was vegetation was vegetation and, and they couldn't see the difference in some of those types of things. And so we went back and that's when we started working with Dr. May Davenport and we did a survey of all the riparian landowners uh, along there and we learned some valuable things about their motivations and have sort of changed our, some of our approaches to that. Um, and some of that is, and, and you may have heard of me talking about this before, is just telling success stories and making it relevant to people locally to do that. And we are starting to get some more traction again on, on doing some of those things that are less visual, but it does pay to study the social mm -hmm. things. I have another little story. Sometimes you make a connection in the strangest way. Um, this was out in another watershed near Montevideo that I was offering some field trips as part of a silent auction to raise money and awareness. And we, the person who purchased the field trip wanted their local um, representatives to go on this trip. And we went to their farm and to their back 40 and drew out memories of how the person used to ice skate from their place all the way to the Minnesota River through a series of connected wetlands. And it just, you have to make it so personal at, at, to get that kind of change. I, um, the role of social science, particularly in, in uh, adaptation of, of um, conservation actions, I think is huge. Uh, my hope is that watershed science uh, in a decision framework with stakeholders can identify here's the portfolio of actions that we need in this fairly big area. Um, then they're going to be, then there's, there's two wishful thinking things. One is hard decisions will have to be made, so we'll have politicians that are willing and able to make those, those <coughs> hard decisions. And those hard decisions will involve uh, then, uh, because this is the U.S. and a lot of this is private land, they'll have to be uh, individual decisions uh, that, that people make, and they're going to have to be financially based. Um, I think that there's innovative uh, things like uh, uh, instead of providing incentives, providing auctions for uh, you know where people bid on on, on uh, uh, getting money to put in certain conservation actions. I mean, there's we spend a lot of money on agriculture. We can we can do better, but if we don't understand why people will adopt or not, um, it's going to be very hard to succeed. And again, who those people are, there is another western Minnesota county where something like 80% of the landowners were women who were renting their fields and educating them actually had a bigger effect on land change. Hmm. Okay, well let's leave it there. Um, again, I'd like to thank Peter for a great talk and, and all of our panelists for joining us this evening. Thanks. And, and thanks to
thanks too to you guys for coming tonight and all those online watching. Um, we want to thank a special thanks to our co-sponsors, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and the Minnesota Association of Water of Soil and Water Conservation Districts. And once again, we want to remind you, those who haven't already joined up, um, that there are applications outside or, or sign-up sheets outside. Um, please take the opportunity, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good night.